Hey you all, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome back to the Summer Short Series where we are getting the super nerdy details on specific subjects all summer long while we gear up for Season 3. I have on the podcast this week one of my favorite farmers, Mr. Steve Groff, who has done just an enormous amount of work with cover crops and is an absolute wealth of knowledge on the subject. He's also got a new book coming out called The Future Proof Farm, which you can and should pre-order now at stevegroff.com. Uh, so go pick that up for real uh, I'll just I don't know wait here do, 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 do. okay so I should probably mention somewhere in this intro that this episode with Steve is entirely dedicated to summer cover cropping and we really dive into some of the different heat and drought tolerant cover crops out there and how to utilize each I will also get Steve back on for a full-length podcast at some point in season three uh, so Patreon members, as always, you will get to ask your questions of the guests. So get those questions ready as you listen. In fact, speaking of Patreon members, today's episode and all of the summer shorts are brought to you by our supporters at patreon.com slash farmer jesse. There are over 400 patrons there who make this podcast happen every week and you can join them and you should join them if this podcast is valuable to you. Uh, two bucks a month. That's not crazy, right? Hopefully we bring you two dollars worth of value every month or at least I don't know, a tip that saves you $24 a year. If not, I'm doing a really poor job at this podcasting thing. Anyway, as an incentive, at a certain level of patronage, or if you just bump up from one level to another, even like 2 to $5, I'll give you a shout-out on the show. So big shout-outs this week to Kevin Keen, Ryan Goser, Yannick Laplante, and John Martin Fortier, who is getting ready to launch Growers & Co. soon. Super excited about that, dude. All right. Enough from me, let's get into this jam-packed summer short with farmer, consultant, podcaster, and author of the book, The Future Proof Farm, which you just pre-ordered, Mr. Steve Croft. All right, Steve, so I want to talk about summer cover crops, um, but I was hoping maybe we could start with like the most obvious of them, which to me in our region is buckwheat. Um, could you talk a little bit about how it should be used, and is there any other cover crop that's kind of fast enough to keep up with it to mix it with so yeah so buckwheat is you know when you said one of the more popular ones that's what came to my mind too and um it grows fast um and, and i know a lot of people understand its characteristics uh it attracts beneficial insects and bees at least most varieties there's a couple varieties of buckwheat that aren't as uh, much of an insect draw. There is a difference in them. If you are interested in attracting bees, if you're making honey or something like that, you want to make sure you get um, a, a selection or a variety uh, that would that actually can do that. And I don't know the names of varieties, but I, I get a little bit, um, what would you say, skeptical sometimes, even when people put names on them, because I've seen names being misplaced on varieties like in this case so if you have someone who said yeah i planted those genetics last year i'm growing some more seed it attracts bees so if you're into that component of buckwheat or you know double kind of a double use for it you want to make sure you get the right ones with bees the other thing is a uh, buckwheat is known to uh, make more phosphorus available uh in my case here where i'm at in southeastern pennsylvania i got plenty of phosphorus uh but there is that one on lock phosphorus that kind of has that technique uh it's able to do that um now as far as companions um with uh, buckwheat in the summer time whenever you start putting mixes together you kind of have to evaluate the physio physiology of the plants like your sorghum sedan is a very another very common summer cover crop sun hemp is very common that's a legume that will add nitrogen quickly. Uh, cowpeas comes to mind as a great summer uh, legume. But if you really want to keep um, your, you know, the the, the proper ratios, uh, you you need to understand uh, how fast these grow. Certainly, the anger is very fast, and it it'll actually could uh, it occurs taller than buckwheat does, and it can kind of almost shade it out eventually if it's planted together. So. The way you do that, if there's a reason you want sorghum sedan in your summer mix, which, by the way, is a good soil builder, um, then you just keep your seeding rate down to maybe three to five pounds per acre of sorghum sedan to allow your buckwheat to flourish in there. 
And, um, you know, another, another thing is, is with the sun hemp or the cowpeas, you know, getting that right ratio of seed density with, so that all your species can thrive together. It's kind of an art and a technique. I mean, I can give seeding rates and ratios and stuff, but it really does come down to what works in your farm. And I tell people, you know, I can give you prescriptions. You can go on the internet and you're going to see conflicting, <laughs> you know, seeding rates. Uh, it, you got to start somewhere in your own farm, keep track of it, and you'll you'll get dialed in in a couple of years. Uh, it's it's the art and technique of farming on that regard. Right. And I think about with buckwheat and sorghum paired together, um, if you do end up with your buckwheat flowering earlier than your Sudan, Sudan can take a light mowing. So in theory, you could mow it high mm-hmm. and sure. it would come back, right? Yes, sir. And that's what, and actually there's been some studies showing that mulching, kind of mowing high and mulching, if you will, that tender biomass on the top, uh, you know, feeds your microbes down the ground when it gets down there. And it actually stimulates root growth, similar to what grazing does. Grazing will stimulate root growth. So um, it's kind of cool how that works. And when you understand that, um, you can do that. Now, I'll just add one other component here, uh, Jesse, and that is that If you need some forage, some summer forage, and sometimes people double up with that, um, you know, buckwheat's probably not the the best thing to add to get forage. It's not going to hurt anything, but, you know, cut your sorghum sedan six inches high if you can, and it'll regrow quickly if you cut it at the, before it gets into the boot stage or when the seeds are coming out. Um, So that's another technique that some farmers, even small scale farmers, they need some some forage for animals or for the winter or whatever. That's another way you can uh, utilize growing plants over the summer. Yeah. And with the buckwheat, the, I remember, I can't remember who I got it from. Uh, there was a cover crop purveyor that gave us some European variety of buckwheat and the seeds were extremely small. So I'm just thinking like in terms of seeding rates, if you were to get 50 pounds of that, um, it was right. probably half the size. So you could probably get half the quantity. Um, well, you bring up a good point, Jesse. I mean, one of the things when I was in the seed business, we started putting on the seeds per pound so people could adjust seeding rates accordingly because it, it really that's really more accurate. Uh, well, you have seeds per pound, then you have the germination rate um, is, is another, th- obviously, will determine your seeding rate. So all these are little nuances that can really help you, um, you know, be more, I'll just say, um, when we talk about economics of cover crops, it's it's not just looking at the cover crop itself. It's looking at your seeding rate and optimizing it, knowing what the germination is in any given seed lot that you have. You can manipulate that a little bit. Now, for a small grower, it doesn't manage. It doesn't matter that much. But if you have more acreage, I mean, if you can save, um, you know, 50 pounds of seed because you have a good germ and maybe smaller seed. You know, why not take advantage of that? Uh, or on the other flip side, you know, you know, you don't want to have a thin crop. Maybe you just have to plant a little more. I've got, I bought cover crop seeds already, but it's like, wow, that was a great price. And then when you uh, get it home here, I looked at the germ and it was low. I thought, okay, no, it wasn't a great price after all. There was a reason why that was cheap. Uh, so if you want to be smart about it, um, when you're when you're buying seed, you know, just ask what their germination is, and and also seeds per pound uh, is is another important thing. Like you brought up there, it's part of the nuances of of making a better deal. I love that. I love it when seed purveyors provide as much information about the seed as possible. Yeah, seeds per pound, seeds per acre, all of that information is so helpful. Um, real quick digression: the broadcasting versus seeding. Like I'm assuming that when you're when you have a drill of some sort, you could pretty much count it out by seed. Um, are there any considerations in terms of like, if you plan to broadcast it versus if you plan to directly seed it? Well, both work, but I'm always going to go with direct seeding if, uh, by, by drilling it. If you have the equipment, uh, it's, it's always more consistent. Um, I, I can say that always, um, broadcasting does work though. It is definitely cheaper. could be faster. Uh, but it all depends on the seed to soil contact that you're able to achieve. Now I'm a no-till farmer. So a lot of times there's previous plant residues or previous cover crop residues. there. just broadcasting on top 
not a not a good chance for consistency in that. Um, and some seeds, the smaller seeds, do tend to germinate better. You get a day or two of rain. But over the summer, broadcasting, just broadcasting without any type of incorporation or let's just say you would have a tilled field, it dries out so quickly because it's warmer and, and windier. And the chances of something working uh, broadcasting over the summer is is low unless you're, like I said, call packing it in or direct seeding it. Uh, so I do not encourage broadcasting unless it's kind of just with the end result and, you know, last ditch effort of doing what you want to do. But you, know, you don't like to waste seed. And I, I have a saying, treat your cover crops like your cash crops. And there's very few cash crops that are broadcasted. Okay. So trying to make a point by, it, it, if you want to get the value out of the money you invest in cover crop seeds, let's treat them as, as a cash crop. That's great. Yeah, no, that's, an, that's, I like the idea of treating it like your cash crop. That's brilliant. Um, yeah. the, okay. So let's move on to a couple of these other ones. You, um, you mentioned sun hemp. Can you talk about that one a little bit? So sun hemp, not to be confused with industrial hemp that, uh, has made the news here in the last couple of years. Uh, by the way, I'm growing CBD hemp too, but uh, this is a total different um, uh, species. Um, now, it's you know, in, in the, the the hemp name indicates it has the fiber qualities to it, but sun hemp is a legume. It does produce nitrogen. The uh, industrial hemp does not. So there's a distinct difference there, uh, and there's no THC at all uh, or CBD in sun hemp. So I just want to clarify that up front. But um, sun hemp is awesome for a legume summer cover crop. You have to wait until, uh, for the most of us, I would say till June to plant it. It doesn't like cool weather. It's a tropical plant. India is where most of it comes from. Even the seed today comes from India, most of it. Because uh, the day length of frost-free days, I mean, has to be almost nine to 11 months. You can't raise seed in the United States except Southern Florida and Hawaii and Southern Texas. So that's, a, it's a tropical plant, it takes a long time to mature, but we can utilize this plant by planting it in the summer. And it's, it's not quite a foot a week after it gets established. In other words, if, if you plant it, in in four weeks, it's probably going to be about three feet tall. In six weeks, about four or five feet tall. It loves hot weather. It can do okay even when it gets dry, but it produces nitrogen. One of the cautions about sun hemp is, is it's a hemp, and it can get fibrous. Once the buds start appearing, or if you start seeing the beautiful little yellow flowers, it's time to do something with it. It's time to terminate it, roll it or rotor tilt, rotor cut it, or whatever you do, um, because it will turn into rope. And uh, if you have any kind of acreage, some people have had it wrap around row cleaners, wrap around closing wheels, literally burn out bearings on, on high acreage situations. Wow. It, it is rope. Um, and so uh, when you see the first flower, now the only thing I would say – is if it's getting into the fall and you you think you're they're, they're calling for some cold weather that might kill it like it's got to be a killing frost a light frost won't kill it we talked about buckwheat buckwheat kills very quickly you can have light frost and it'll, it'll singe it back really pretty pretty good sun hemp 28 degrees a hard killing frost will pretty much take sun hemp out so um, that usually happens after it starts flowering. And another thing you need to know about sun hemp is it's triggered to flower by the shortening days in the fall. So it will generally start flowering the end of August or the middle of September uh, in pretty much the center part of the U.S. in the, you know, the I-70 corridor, we'll call it, um, ish. So uh, in that, in that range, it doesn't matter if you plant June 1st or July 1st or, you know, the end of July. Uh, you'll have six to eight foot tall plants planted in June starting to flower, and then you have a foot and a half tall plants planted the 1st of August starting to flower at the same time. So then it'll start to trigger that fiber, fiber mechanism. Now, the shorter the plants are, the less critical it is 
to terminate it. But that's a little bit of a warning label, I'm going to say, or a caution label, maybe, that comes with sun hemp. It's, it's difficult to, uh, to manage once it starts flowering, uh, it, or it could be a problem. It depends on your situation. If you're really small scale, do hand tools and stuff like that, not a big deal. Um, but I just want to make sure that, you know, people understand the nature of this. It, it, it does put on nitrogen. Uh, it's a good nitrogen producer. And you do have to have an inoculant. Um, make sure you have an inoculant that has, that has sun hemp or zobi in it uh, to, to make it do the, to maximize its legume uh, capabilities, production of nitrogen, actually. And that fibrous nature of it, is that reflected underground too? Does it, does it become something that would be hard to plant right after? No, I haven't noticed that. Nope, I haven't noticed that. It's just that the stalk itself, uh, it's, it's the, the concern is wrapping around equipment. That's the concern. The next one that's kind of on my mind or the next group would be the millets. Do you have anything to, to talk about in terms of pearl millet? Sorry, pearl millet, uh, Japanese millet, etc. Yep. Yeah, I plant all them. Um, I love pearl millet. And I think the reason I love it is because it has like a cattail, um, what do I call it, seed head or whatever. It just right. looks cool. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, pearl millet, uh, you know, yeah, the sorghum sedan is probably the most aggressive. Uh, pearl millet, though, is a close second. Um, maybe a little finer stemmed. Again, when I, when I make these statements, there's probably 30 different selections of sorghum sedan. There's probably 10 different selections of pearl millet and a Japanese millet. I mean, when we, when we put these names out there, they're helpful, but sometimes there's a wide array of expression of even in the same category. So I'm just going to put that out there for pretty much any cover crop there is. But, uh, I mean, you can even mix all the millets together, pearl millet, Japanese millet, sorghum sedan, if you want that diversity within the grass type species. Uh, but you're getting, it's a nuance. It's a little different than sorghum sedan. And then sometimes check your local pricing. Sometimes the cost per acre is different for whatever reason. As I understand right now, there's going to be shortages this year on some of the sorghum sedan. That's what I've been hearing. Uh, maybe pearl millet would be an obvious replacement. But just to understand that if you can't get what you want or if the price is high, uh, you know, know what your other options are. And that's why I think, uh, you know, it's good to know this. J- Japanese millet generally doesn't, it's now it's starting to look more like a foxtail. It's not a weed, but it's starting to look more like that. It's a little bit lower, broad leaf, uh, excuse me, a wide leafed grass, uh, more uh, so, but, um, but the, the, these are good for building the mycorrhizae populations um, and just for soil health. All these have really fantastic root systems and, um, and and so forth. So I think, you know, I, I'll plant like all three of them together sometimes, but not all the time. Um, and then, like I said, you know, if you need to switch and swap a little bit because of pricing, um, you've got to know what your options are. And, and that's how I would characterize pearl millet. Um, you got to try it sometime. If nothing else, it's just kind of cool. Yeah. No, it's a beautiful plant. Um, yeah. Cow peas. Yes. Are you, are you a fan? Um, cow, cow peas and sun hemp are kind of in a similar category with one distinct difference. The similarities are they like heat. They can do well in the summer. Uh, they're aggressive. They grow fast. But the big difference is cow peas from the fibrous standpoint is everything sun hemp is, is not. Um, so cow peas are a vine. They're like a pea, but... They look like a bean, uh, more so. And the vines can, you know, if you plant them early enough, they can grow six, eight feet. But if there's nothing else with them, they'll just be a foot tall on the ground because they just lay down. Uh, one of the, a nice mix is sorghum sedan and cow peas, cause it, or pearl for that matter, because it can kind of climb up in the other cover crop. And whenever you have that synergy, the same thing happens with cereal rye, triticale, and hairy vetch. They help each other. Um, and cow peas like the vine and they will climb up a sorghum sedan. And because of that, it keeps them off the ground and they, uh, they retain more leaves. They actually grow taller. Uh, they'll grow more. Um, I, I don't have data to back it up, but you know, when you see it, you can just see how that sorghum sedan is providing a trellis for it. 
but then the cowpeas are providing nitrogen for that sort of sedan. So it's a synergistic effect. And um, I, I would always grow cowpeas with an erect plant um, that would help it be better. And unless there's a reason not to, I can't think of many not to, but uh, cowpeas are, are very succulent compared to uh, sun hemp. Uh, you know, you, if you're going to no-till in them, you can cut right through them. They're very easy to cut through. Um, cowpeas might grow a little bit better than sun hemp. We're going to compare that. Sun hemp does when the temperature gets into the 40s overnight. Sun hemp starts it starts slowing up. Uh, starts getting yellowish, and uh, cowpeas can maybe grow a little longer. So, you know, when it comes to about the 10th of August. You know, it's time to switch over to cowpeas from sun hemp or, or you know, um, focus more on the cowpeas. I think they'll do better for you in the latter part of the late summer than, than sun hemp. So that's just been some of my observations of that. Is there anything else in the summer mix that you like or that we've overlooked here? Well, <clears throat> there would be some other ones like mung beans. Um, they're shorter. Let's just picture a string bean that, has a little bit longer tentacles to it, but it's uh, these cool little green seeds. If you never saw a mung bean seed, they're fascinating. They're like smaller than peas, but they're like a, uh, I don't know, it's like a grassy green color, kind of uh, a lighter green color. It's just, they're round, it's like a half the size of a soybean kind of. Uh, they do well in dry land areas, particularly seem to handle drought well. Um, that would be a next one. I mean, there's, there is all kinds of other ones, Jesse, that we could talk about. Uh, TEF, uh, uh, TEF has just been too difficult to get established right. It's a very, very tiny seed. It, if you could get it planted just right, I, but it's just so difficult to get it established. Uh, the ones we have mentioned are definitely the most popular for a reason. There, there will probably be 20 more we could talk about. Um, I will mention something now that if you're, let's say you're in the backside of summer here, you're in August. And depending on what you want to do next in your field, you can start thinking about adding some radishes. Uh, radishes don't do well in the heat of summer, but uh, we used to have a mix we liked that was uh, sun hemp, sorghum sedan, and radishes. And the radishes just be down underneath. Uh, they can't <clears throat> compete <clears throat> with, the, with the summer annuals. But then when your first hard freeze comes, let's just say it's October for a lot of us, um, they die, sunlight gets down, and them radishes really take off for six weeks. And they, in a way, they can kind of take up some of the legume nitrogen that the sun hemp made and help carry that over. So I'm just going to add that as kind of a what you start thinking about as the summer winds, winds on, as the summer winds down, I should say. That's perfect. Well, Steve, thank you so much for your time and for your insight. Always happy to do it. All right, if you enjoyed that episode, and I know it was too short, but if you enjoyed that episode, check out the links in the show notes. I'll try and put up as many of those links as I can, but Steve is also really prolific. He hosts a podcast series called the Cover Crop, called Cover Crop Strategies. He does a lot of writing. There are some great videos out there with Steve. He's been on several podcasts like the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast with John Kemp. So again, we'll hook it up with links in your podcast app or at notillgrowers.com, and also go visit stevecroft.com for more info and to pick up that book. Follow him on Twitter, too. Yeah, all the things. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you are getting it um, so you are good and ready for Season 3 when it drops. Rate and review the podcast as well. Big thanks to Jackson Roulette and Josh Satin for all of their help. Enormous thank you to Hannah Crabtree for all of her work behind the scenes. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.